Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our grants interest meeting for rounds 26. Uh, we've been doing affordable materials grants in some form since 2014. Uh, it's uh, really, really cool to be doing this 10 years later. Uh, I think if someone asked me when I was uh, jumping into this visiting program officer role, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And I said, at my house running a grants interest meeting, it would alarm folks. They'd be like, really? But here, here we are. <laughs> we are still doing this, trying to make cool stuff happen because teams of folks uh, just like you are coming up with amazing ideas and putting them into action. All right, so I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the program director of Affordable Learning Georgia. Um, we are within Galileo, which is Georgia's virtual library. Uh, I am a librarian by trade, um, and with us today is Nikita Afaha, our program manager. Uh, please introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Again, as Jeff said, I'm Nikita Afaha. I'm program manager for Affordable Learning Georgia. And by trade, I'm actually an instructional designer. So um, among a company, though, with all of you all who are faculty members as well as librarians like Jeff. All right. Um, so please in chat, share who you are. Um, what's your institution? Is it your first time? And why are affordable and open resources important to you? Now that's a lot to type in. Some of you have your, your home keys memorized and you'll be able to do it immediately. Others, uh, we may not be doing that later. Oh, and I was you know, I was supposed to pass this to you to do this, Nikita. I'm sorry no. about that. <laughs> no, no, it's OK. It's OK. Actually, you you navigate the chats a little bit more with a little bit more finesse than I do anyway. So uh, <laughs> I was actually hoping you might forget. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. lucky day. <laughs> Yeah, but like Jeff said, everyone, please go ahead and start uh, sharing in the chat with us um, an introduction of yourselves. And Welcome, uh, Jeff, Dr. if you don't mind, I will turn it over to you because you, you do handle this part okay. expertly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Welcome from uh, Georgia Gwinnett College, Dr. Padani, first time. Uh, Mandy and uh, Dr. Shoshana Hook. Uh, OK, so Mandy says, first time looking forward to helping my teacher candidates. Aha. All right. Education department. Uh, with more affordable resources in my courses. Um, oh, OK. Uh, so let's see here. We have one person without um, sound. Please go to more. And then what do they call it now? Audio settings, yeah. audio settings. And while Jeff is doing that, Chances I guess I will go through a good. few of the chat right. there. Um, speaker. Sorry. We have got quite a few members uh, joining us today from Albany and KSU, Fort Valley, I see. Um, uh, GGC, Georgia Gwinnett mm -hmm. College as well, Savannah State, uh, Morris Brown here. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Middle um, Georgia. Dr. Dr. Samudra, uh, first time with ALG, been trying to convert my intro class to PA uh, using free materials. Excellent. Public administration, I'm, I'm guessing there. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, Georgia Southern College of Public Health. Albany State University, first time. Fort Valley State University, hello. Oh, uh, more Georgia Gwinnett College, how's it going? Uh, Jane Nichols at Savannah State University in the Center for Professional Excellence. All right. And we got Middle Georgia State, Morris Brown. Wow, interesting. OK, so um, Dr. Randolph from Morris Brown, the grants are for USG institutions, so we cannot award them to Morris Brown College. If you're running a program like this and you want to learn more about how we do it, you are more than welcome to stay this whole time. Um, but there will not be funds going to Morris Brown through this program because it's just USG funding. I know. I, I wish I could spread this around all over the place, but I work for the USG. Uh, let's see here. Okay, KSU, Georgia State. Hello. More Fort Valley, Georgia Highlands, laboratory manager in the School of STEM. Excellent. Dr. Wong from Kennesaw State. Georgia Tech Chemistry, first time learning about ALG, interested in access for students. Very cool. 
Georgia Tech just uh, got a new librarian who focuses on affordable learning, too. Yeah. It's really neat to see. Uh, Peter Fielding, how's it going? Uh, Brittany Lott, first time here. Uh, Office of Academic Affairs. Oh, from the Medical College of Georgia. Okay. Um, and I believe that is in partnership with Augusta, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Albany State, uh-huh. Executive Director of Global Campus. Excellent. Yeah, oh, second time with ALG. Good uh, Good to see you, Dr. Swell. And Dr. Sayo. Oh, Claire, good to see you again. Uh, Shivani Ramotar from West Georgia. Very cool. We got computer science. Ah, Albany State, West Georgia. Analytics and modeling. Ah, yep. Uh, Nicole Watkins, first time from Albany State. Um, uh huh. From UWG in the education department. Hello. Uh, Rosa Williams, Columbus State. Yes. Good to see you again. Um, Dr. Wen from uh, uh, Augusta. I want students to have less financial stress. Absolutely. That is one of the big things about this. Um, one of the one of the contributors to it as a hidden cost is something that really hits students that way. Uh, learning to learn about integrating OER into courses. Very cool. Uh, we do have training resources on our site at affordablelearninggeorgia.org as well. This is going to be a lot about our grants and not so much about what is OER because then I'd be taking up your whole day. Um, but please do check out our website because we have plenty of stuff there uh, to introduce you to OER. And support equitable access, true equitable access, right? Yes, uh, being able to have everyone have access to their resources without financial burdens on them. Yes. Dr. Kabir, Dr. Hilly. Wow, there's some, we have 59 people in here today. Hello. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, some folks um, are seeing each other in here and going, oh my goodness. Hey, it's, <laughs> they're like, hey, it's Darkest Newton. How are you? Uh, and Dr. lots of Jones. first hours. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, the game design department at KSU, psychological science. Well, welcome, everyone. There, there's so many of you. <laughs> a lot of times we could just get into a real conversation of like, here's exactly why this is important to me. But that's when we have like 13 people. I cannot believe how many folks are here. This is so cool. Um, hello. All right. So um, let's keep going. I want to make sure <laughs> that you get the right information uh, for your grants, but please do keep filling out stuff in chat if, if you have something uh, to add. So there are some very helpful links here um, that you'll want to know, especially that first one that helps you apply for a grant. Uh, so Nikita, why don't you run these down for me? Yeah, absolutely. And again, welcome to everyone. So some of these helpful links for you, um, first of all, for how to apply to find the request for proposal and apply for a grant, you're going to go to affordablelearninggeorgia.org um, backslash grants backslash apply for a grant. There you're going to find all kinds of information that um, Jeff might actually be able to go over with us a little bit later on in the presentation, should we have time to, to dig deep. Some other important links for you are going to be checking out some of the uh, uh, previous projects, including their proposals and our grants archive, also on our Affordable Learning Georgia website. Um, as finally, your each institution, each USG institution has a set of ALG champions um, that are at your house at your institution that you can refer to for more information. And their list of them are also on your on the website at Affordable Learning Georgia as well. You can find the names of your library champion, your faculty champion, as well as your instructional design champion. Uh, and I believe um, we will definitely be sharing these links. Yes, yeah, so Jeff is putting in the chat there. We'll be sharing these links in presentation um, after the after the end, um, presentation today. Yep. So, I mean, expect an email at some point, probably the next day or later this afternoon with the video on it. Um, the video, we add it to YouTube because if we put it in our shared system over here on SharePoint, only people with a usg.edu domain address can access it, and then it just gets very weird. So instead, we put it on YouTube, and if you know how the YouTube process works, first it gets uploaded, then it starts getting available in like a really low resolution, which is not good for text, 
then it gets up to HD. And by the time it's in HD, that's when you should be able to view it. Uh, if, if I shared it while it was in SD format, you'd be like, what the heck? What's going on there? <laughs> and I'll so, go ahead yeah. and drop some of these in the chat for us now as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nikita. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is run down the types of grants. Um, for some of you, this is a review. For others who have just come in and are like, I have no idea what affordable materials grants are, this is going to be very important. Uh, so the first type is the one that we started with, transformation grants. They are the kind of grants where you have a course that has commercial resources in it. Students are paying a lot for them. You want to replace them with affordable materials, but you need a lot of time and a team to get together to create new stuff where stuff doesn't exist, to find great stuff that's out there, to remix stuff uh, using the power of open uh, in order to make it hyper relevant to your students. Um, that's the first one. You transform your course from something expensive to something affordable. Uh, that can't happen all the time, right? If you're already using affordable resources and you want to make your course better, this one's not for you. This is the big heavy lift of transforming a course. Um, and yeah, so that's what we started with in round one. Uh, that's the only ones that we had at that time. Um, and since then, we've added a couple of other ones. Transformation grants, because you are generating student savings, um, are going to include estimates for how much you're going to save students each semester and each year. Uh, we do summer, fall, spring. I know that folks out there have summer one, two, and three. Uh, we have winter sessions sometimes before spring starts up. Just lump them in. Uh, you know, there's there's just the summer block, the fall block, and the spring block. Most um, USG system office reports focus on summer, fall, spring. That's the fiscal year, starts in summer, ends at the end of spring. Um, that's the same with us because we have to do those kinds of reports. So therefore we are asking um, for just summer, fall, and spring. Uh, the annual amount of students is the sum of the above students per semester, right? So you've got that number. The original cost of your required materials. Now, if you've got on the syllabus that you can also um, get this reference book and it's an encyclopedia and it's $300 and there's five volumes of it, but it's not required for this course. Don't include that in your application because we'll look at it and go, what the heck? Wait a minute. Is this required? And then we'll go and ask you about it um, because if you're not doing that, then students don't have to purchase it, right? Uh, so you're not necessarily saving students that money. Um, it would be cool if suddenly you made an open encyclopedia and it made things even better for your course. That would be a different kind of grade. Um, so include your required materials only, your textbook for sure. If you're doing a transformation of your lab, that would be your lab manual. Um, so yeah, the original cost of those re required materials. Now, if you're doing a transformation in which students will have to pay a small amount of money for the new resources, you'll have to include the new cost of those required materials. So you've got the cost you're going to no longer put on students, and then you've got the new cost, which is sometimes zero. It's often zero if you're using OER. Um, but sometimes it's 10, 15. If you're using Lumen Waymaker, it's a small amount, but it still is an amount. And what you would do is for the amount of savings per students affected, you would subtract the new cost from the original cost to get your per student savings. Now, if you multiply the per student savings by the number of students you affect per year, um, that's your annual savings estimate. Uh, same thing with per semester. Now, this might be weird for you to do at first. Try to be as accurate as possible. Uh, we will ask you each year how it's going. Um, are you still using the materials that you've uh, used before? Are there changes to uh, student enrollments? Are there changes to the original cost of those required materials? Uh, have they released a new version and it's $100 less or $100 more? Like, That's very important uh, for our own reporting sake. Our data relies on your reporting. And therefore, when you're presenting this information in a transformation grant application, be sure to the best of your knowledge that this is accurate. 
Also, these are direct savings. This is not something where you would go, okay, well, my team of three faculty are adopting these resources and saving students money, but we've got 12 faculty over here and they might take it on after the project is done or they might not. And if all of them took it on, here's my optimistic estimate. We don't want that because we want to be able to tell anyone who's within looking at our program um, that they have saved students at least this amount. It's probably more because it probably has spread, but um, our estimate is as accurate as possible. It's not, well, hopefully people took this on and they hopefully save students this much. We want to say, this is the amount of savings that our projects are generating. Uh, so be sure to include your direct savings, the ones that you are implementing in your courses, uh, not ones that could possibly happen later on, but aren't in it. Uh, yeah, OK, so that's that's a big thing about transformation grants that doesn't have to do with the other two. Uh, the funding structure for this is more than the others, and that's because this is a bigger chunk of time. You are transforming everything about your course. You have to take a look at your learning outcomes. You have to take a look at the curriculum, make sure you're aligning it with everything that needs to get done for your students. Um, that includes meetings. It includes consensus building. There's a lot. Um, so this is a $5,000 maximum award per team member. Um, and that's for your salary, for course release, for travel, however your institution is able to do it. This does include fringes, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later in funding, but this includes things like your health care associated with being paid extra. Um, we can't go above this limit, including fringes. Uh, those are considered direct expenses because they have to do with paying for your time. Now, there are additional project expenses that you can put in here. Let's say you need a, a software program in order to create something. Uh, let's say you're you're going into the world of generative AI art to do like cool decorative backdrops to what you're doing. Like, be sure you justify that in your proposal, but that stuff is allowed. Um, it's going to be reviewed and therefore it will be scrutinized. So be sure that it is connected to your goals. Um, maximum total award per grant is 30,000. So you could theoretically have a team of six with a maximum amount per person. You could have more team members with less uh, of an amount. You could have uh, fewer team members and some additional project expenses, but they don't go over 5,000. Uh, so be sure to know these are maximum awards. You do not have to do exactly this amount if you want to fit uh, other people into your team. Uh, but you cannot go over it for sure. Uh, if you have other project costs, be sure to incorporate them in. Just make it very clear. Include it in the budget. Include it in your plan. Uh, if I see a whole bunch of computers in your budget, I'm like, whoa, that's a lot. And I go looking in the plan for where that is, and it's not there. We're just going to be very confused. So be sure to justify um, all of your expenses within your plan. Uh, so those are the considerations for transformation grants. Some of them, like including additional expenses, have to do with all of these projects. Uh, some of them, like your savings amounts, they don't have to do with the other two categories. The first of those is the first one we added. So let's say you've had uh, affordable resources in your course the whole time, or you've done a transformation project a while back and you want to improve the resources in your course. Uh, to keep things sustainable and, and you know make sure that you're able to teach with these affordable resources moving forward as times change. Uh, that's what a continuous improvement grant is all about. Uh, these are ways to improve your low cost or no cost courses through revising OER, a major revision, or through creating new open resources. Uh, this would not be incorporating uh, paid resources outside of what you're doing. It It is something that may improve your course, but it's not something that we can fund for the time that it would take to do that. Um, this would be something where you're creating stuff and we are able to share it out with the rest of the world so that other folks can improve their courses in the same way. 
So yeah, it, it could be a substantial revision of existing resources. And again, if you need to know more about what open educational resources are, we have a whole bunch of training uh, on our site about it. Um, also, the creation of new OER. So if you create ancillary materials, uh, this is a great way to create them, improve them, and share them. Uh, ancillary materials are the non-textbook materials that support the instruction of a course. Uh, so your, your open online courses, your lecture slides, your videos, your podcasts, etc. And so these um, used to be called mini grants. We are just more defining it by its function now than by its structure. But there is still a $2,000 maximum per team member. This is a smaller project. Um, there are, as we said before, additional project expenses allowed. Be sure to justify them. Um, you can theoretically have uh, up to five people with a maximum of $2,000, or you can bring the, the amount down and include more people on your team, but the $10,000 is the maximum total award per grant. Um, there's more details on this, of course, uh, in our request for proposals. That's on the apply for a grant uh, webpage that Nikita has included already. Uh, so then there's one more that we recently added. And OK, so we already have a way for folks to transform their courses. We have a way for folks to make their courses more sustainable and create new resources that we can then share with the rest of the world so that this practice expands and, and just keeps going. But what about the bigger questions about making your course affordable or making your course open? Uh, we assume a lot when we're creating our goals and our plans. We are going to increase student success by improving access, that type of stuff. But what about five years down the line? You've been doing this for a long time, and now you want to find out, is this making a difference? Um, what if you have a really interesting question that no one's ever answered before about perceptions, about the structure of an open text, about the intersection of AI? Like, those types of things can't really be covered by our previous two grants, but it really does serve the mission of ALG to get these big questions answered. That's where research grants come into this. Uh, they are opportunities to explore the bigger questions related to stuff in Affordable Learning Georgia. This is mainly about open education, but it's not restricted to it. Affordable education, too. Uh, these need to address at least one of the aspects of the KU framework from the Open Education Group. Uh, that's cost, outcomes, usage, and perceptions. Uh, a lot of folks will look at outcomes because that is one of the big things. We have done this, how did it work? Um, but things like usage, do people actually read an open textbook when it's shared with everyone? Those are important too. Uh, there was a, a study that happened at Kennesaw State with, um, I believe it was Jonathan Arnett who helmed the first uh, part of it using some analytics to find out if access uh, improved reading. And it was mixed on how that actually worked out. So yeah, exploring these types of questions like perceptions. What do students think of an instructor that now has an open textbook? Do they think, oh, this is, uh, this is free, so therefore it can't be as good? Or do they say, wow, they really helped me out with this? Like that kind of stuff can really affect someone's decision to take this on. And so a research grant really helps with that question. Uh, these end with a research report. This is not a journal article. This is a report on what you did, what you found. It's very broad. It's not something that can't be published in a peer reviewed journal later on. We want to make sure that you can actually use your research in nice, creative ways that fit the uh, scholarship demands of your institution, too. Um, we will be sharing those research reports in an ALG repository. They will be under a Creative Commons license, which means that folks can take them on. Um, and things like data sets, we won't share those in the repository, especially because who knows if there's personally identifiable information in some spreadsheets that are out there? Like maybe you're thinking, oh, well, these student IDs aren't connected to anything, these student ID numbers. And then later on, you find out that they're connected to three numbers in someone's social security number. And it's like, oh, no, we are avoiding that. We're just not sharing those data sets out. 
unless you want them to be shared. If you're an expert on this stuff and you say, there's no PII in here at all, I want to share this out, we totally will. Um, but we will not require you to share the, that part out. So the outline, what does it look like? Well, there's a standard set of information about your team. Um, you know, here's these people, their titles, their email, et cetera. Um, two or three paragraph summary of the project. What were your goals, your objectives? What were the research questions you were trying to answer? How did you try to answer it? That's your methodology, of course. I mean, we're, we're faculty here, we know this part. Um, and your findings and hopefully how these might be applied later on, even if it means we need more research. Um, and yeah, a, a description, but not a replication of your data. You don't have to put your tables in there. Um, just a little bit about what you've found and then your future plans. We're looking to publish this. We're looking to present it at this conference. Uh, you know, knowing that this is leading to scholarship really helps us understand the value of it uh, as we move forward. You will have to work with your IRB at your institution. There are some research guidelines uh, that the USG has for all of its institutions, but the IRB at each institution is unique and separate from that, and you're going to have to go with them. Um, that IRB already follows the USG guidelines, but each institution has very different processes. So be sure that you know that if you are going to do research, you have to work with them. Um, even if it's going to be exempt, you have to make sure that they deem it exempt. Uh, so know your procedures at your institution for getting this done. This can be a stumbling block, as we all know, in our research processes if we're not ready for it. So be ready for it before it starts. Um, the publication of it, you can you can publish in a peer-reviewed journal. We would love for you to publish in an open access journal. We think that that's a really ethical model. It doesn't, it, it's not restricted to open access journals though. Um, everyone has very different tenure and promotion uh, procedures and guidelines. So we want to make sure that we can honor that here. So it's not a requirement. So the funding structure, same as continuous improvement grants, 2,000 maximum per team member, 10,000 maximum total award per grant, additional project expenses are allowed. Okay, so the timeline for this one, you already know about uh, the first part, but uh, Nikita is gonna walk you through this timeline. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll pause for questions in just a little bit, but I just wanna go through the timeline with you guys um, very quickly. So for round 26, and as Jeff said, we've been doing this for about 10 years now, um, but round 26, we have um, those projects will be ending uh, fall 2025. And so the application deadline is coming up on Monday, October 28th. It'll be at midnight um, for you to submit your application online. And then from there, we'll be having uh, the reviews um, through November 18th. And then by Tuesday, November 19th, during the day, we would uh, provide the notifications of the awards. Um, from there, we have to move on to uh, the uh, SLAs, the agreements, get those sent out for signatures. Um, and then we will have, for those who have been selected and have their SLAs signed, the online kickoff meeting um, on January 3rd of, of 2020, 2025. Um, and that will be uh, virtual as well. Um, we'll also have a midpoint check-in um, for these grant projects by uh, July 11th. Uh, 2025. So about halfway through this project um, being done, we'll have a midpoint check in. And then finally, um, again, at the end of fall 2025, December 19th, we'll have the final reports and materials will be due for um, for this round. Um, a couple of things to note about that um, is that one team member will be required to attend the online synchronous um, kickoff meeting and the midpoint check in meeting. Um, all members are required to participate in a web-based synchro asynchronous training. Um, that is a link that you'll be sent um, before the kickoff meeting as well. And, but if you've completed this in asynchronous training before, but within a year, you are exempt from, from this requirement. Um, before I move on to the next slide though, Jeff, are there any other considerations that um, our participants need to know for the timeline? Yeah, so if you are uh, new to this process, you're looking at this timeline and going, okay, there it is. If you're not new to this process, you might be looking at the reviews and going, wait a minute, I thought there were peer and administrative reviews in here. 
Usually, we involve the USG community in, rev in reviewing all of these applications. That happens by paying peer reviewers for their time. However, the SLAs, which you're going to have in order to get signed, they can take a while, and the peer review process moves quickly. And unfortunately, legal services was looking at that and saying, look, the, the, the contracts are moving way slower than the work is, and we can't actually get these signs by the time that the work is complete. So we have to put that on hold and find a new way. So we are taking this year to find a new way to involve um, USG faculty from throughout um, our institutions in the review process. But until then, it's going to be an administrative review process, which we have done the whole time. Uh, we've been doing this since <laughs> round one, although, you know, we, I'm saying ALG has been doing this uh, since round one administrative reviews. Uh, so they are going to be the basis for selection this time around, and we will be gathering information on how to include uh, peer reviewers moving forward on our grants. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Nikita says, yep. Yeah unable to log in for a computer, working with, oh, on a, with another coworker at the institution. Oh, okay. Well, hi, Jessica and Tiquanda. How are you? <laughs> and yes, we will have a recording available if you missed anything. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff, for that, for that, for that information about the peer reviewer process as well. Um, for those of you who are returning and may have been wondering, that was a little bit missing in the, in the timeline. Um, now we, we're going to move on. Um, there's, Jeff is going to run through how to apply for the grants. But before we do that, are, are there any questions so far about what Jeff has gone through with the types of grants, the transformation, the continuous improvement, as well as the research grants um, and for the timeline? And we'll just take a few moments to go through some of those questions before we move on. Um, we do want to make sure we have time to get to the rest of everything, but drop those yeah. questions in the chat. Um, um, so Dr. Calavar says, what percentage of applicants get funded? This will depend on the round. Um, we have a certain amount of funding per year, and that uh, amount of funding can change over time as state funds increase or decrease. If you ever see in the news that uh, there's a 1.7% reduction across the board, that includes ours. Um, and also, it depends on how many applications we get and how many of them both qualify and stand out as great applications. We are not highly selective. We want people to get this stuff done. Um, so when there are a good amount of good applications, like we did in our uh, previous round, I would say around 75% of those were awarded. And if you are not awarded in that particular round, that doesn't mean that your project is rejected for all time. Uh, that really just means that we uh, would like you to revise it and resubmit it in a later round. Uh, we we don't want you to not make your courses affordable, right? Uh, but we definitely want to make sure that when you get started, you have a great plan. It, it depends a lot more on the quality of the application and the funding we have available um, than anything else. We're not trying to be overly selective and prestigious. We are trying to make sure that we award projects that are going to make a difference and that are set up for success. Um, OK, Chandler Hilly says, what about projects with teams that include both instructors who use publisher materials and those who use OER? Is this still a transformation grant? It is if you are moving those instructors to uh, open materials or affordable materials from commercial materials. But the impact you're going to have on student savings that's only going to be with those team members who are using commercial resources. So you'll have to be specific about that. Um, you can't say that you are now saving your students uh, $200 if they are spending zero in your course because you're using OER. That's, I mean, that's amazing. That's great that you're already doing that. Um, but your project is going to be to move those uh, commercial publisher courses to OER, um, if I'm reading this correctly, and therefore the student impact is going to be just for those courses with the commercial course at the moment that will be moving to OER. I hope that makes sense. Okay, good, good, good. Um, Dr. Williams says, if you've done transformation in one course of a sequence and want to extend the use of OER to the entire sequence. So 
this is going to depend on what's needed for that course. So you've got intro uh, astronomy and the solar system, stars and galaxies, and the lab. Let's say that you have, OK, so there's a really easy one that I've encountered in the past. Folks um, have an anatomy and physiology one course, right? And they move to an OpenStax text for anatomy and physiology. They have a giant textbook for that. And they are going to use it for anatomy and physiology too. But also, students would have bought an anatomy and physiology textbook in ANP1. They would not have bought a textbook in ANP2. And in that case, you are not generating more student savings in anatomy and physiology too. If you're just going to do a transformation grant project for ANP2 at that point, it's going to be zero dollars in student savings, which seems not very impactful. That would be a continuous improvement grant project because what you're really doing is not moving folks from a commercial resource to an OER text. What you're doing is you're changing the ancillary materials around. You're creating new stuff surrounding the course. Um, you've already made the big move, and now you're making uh, smaller adjustments to include it in the same course where they would have bought the textbook the first time around. Now, if you have two courses in a sequence and one has a textbook and the other one has a different textbook, then absolutely you are generating student savings in that second course. Um, yeah, so Dr. Williams, if you've got two courses with two separate textbooks, then yes, you are absolutely doing a transformation grant project that generates student savings. Um, if you're not, then you're not. And a $0 uh, savings in a transformation grant doesn't really look that great. Uh, continuous improvement grant would be that in that case. I hope that that makes sense too. All right, thank you, Jeff. And if there oh, are more questions, go ahead. Oh, sorry, there's one more. Um, Dr. Nixon says, are grants only for faculty? I am a staff member. So this is going to depend on the project. And I know I'm gonna say this a lot, it depends. It's kind of wishy-washy, right? But in this case, it really is. Let's say that you're a staff member that doesn't teach a course. You do not have a team of anyone that teaches a course, and you're applying for a transformation grant, which has to do with the teaching of courses. That probably won't work uh, because you really need faculty to make the change from commercial resources to uh, open or affordable materials in that case. But if you're going to let's say that you have a writing center or um, you teach library instruction, you're going to create an open textbook to support that. That would be a really cool continuous improvement grant. You've got something you're teaching uh, that needs improvement and you're going to create open stuff that we can then share out with the world um, under an open license. That's totally valid for a continuous improvement grant. If you're a staff researcher and you want to take a look at the effects of OER at your institution, that's a really interesting case. And I think that an application would be really nice for that. Um, yeah, so that's, I hope that that clarifies it. It really depends on what the team is and what they're going to do. Um, oh, Dr. Ezekiel says, can we apply for round 26 and 27 for back-to-back -back projects? Will the timelines overlap? The timelines will overlap. Uh, round 26 is in the fall, round 27 is in the spring, and then one's going to end next fall, one's going to end next spring. So you got a lot of time in between, especially that summer where both projects would be happening. Um, if you are able to take this on, if you've got a team of five to six people and you're like, we can knock this out, we can do both and check out how cool um, both of these projects are. They qualify. Um, and they stand out on their own merit, then great, um, apply in round 26 and round 27. And if they're feasible, then yes, absolutely. If they're not feasible for you and you look at the timeline and you're like, I don't know if we can get this done, I would wait in that, in that point, uh, unless you can get more team members on board to help you uh, do all of these things that may seem unfeasible because these, this stuff's overlapping. Uh, at KSU for a long time, we had uh, Tiffany Tiarina, uh, back then Reardon, 
who was an instructional designer who found herself being a project manager for a whole bunch of different grant projects. She would be the grant submitter and she would bring in different teams of faculty and she would be the project manager uh, for both of those. That's fine. I I'm good with that. She applied back to back all the time. But that's a very special case because she was the project manager for teams of faculty who were doing different things. Uh, so yeah, uh, when I say it, this question depends, it really does depend on, on the team and the feasibility. Um, Dr. Crawford, is evaluation of transformation grants based on per student savings or total student savings? A little bit of both. So you don't have huge enrollments in your courses, but the cost per student is high. When you have small courses like this, and you want to do a transformation project, and your course is somewhat unique at your institution, I would recommend reaching out to other institutions to do a multi-institution project so that you know, you're all addressing the same course, and it's a big project taking place uh, among a lot of little courses, or you include it as part of a multi-course project in your department. Well, I'm teaching this small course with 20 people. They're teaching this other course, and they're going to work on that with 20 people. We're going to have a central coordinator uh, who's going to make all of this stuff open and accessible. Well, now we're affecting 40 students, right? And you can kind of add on to that. KSU's IT department um, does a really great job of that in continuous improvement grants, too. Um, they are like, we have a department of folks who are going to be doing a bunch of revision work because we have a zero cost degree program and there's like five courses here but we're all responsible for some of these and someone's going to coordinate it at the top that's totally fine that's that's great um dr nixon says oh uh do all teams need to consist of teams of faculty can a group of instructional designers be a team a group of instructional designers can be a team but it would again depend on the type of grant that you're applying for. Um, if you are teaching a course and you are replacing commercial resources, then that would be a transformation grant project. Most of the time, you're going to have teaching faculty in those courses. Whoa, hey there. Um, Siri decided to try to talk to me. Um, yeah, uh, but if you're creating new OER for a department that needs it and are going to implement it, and you're a bunch of instructional designers, you can do that. Just be very specific as to the project and how it's going to work. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, actually, we're missing yeah. a couple. So before you go back to the end, go let's ahead. make sure we go back a few. Um, right after the round 26, 27 question, um, we have, uh, does the team need to consist of faculty members from the same discipline? And then yeah. we have, can a team member be from another USG institution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to elide into the faculty members from the same discipline part because it really, uh, just like with the other ones, the question is, is this a feasible project? Uh, does it make sense? So let's say that you've got a computer science department and they have a couple of courses where they want to do intro computer science. And then you've got a humanities department that, that has a course that teaches it just on Milton's Paradise Lost. Unless the computer science folks are helping out somehow with that, it really doesn't make sense to put those two together. But let's say that you have five humanities courses that all deal with single works and they're all exploring it in a, in a weird, interesting way. And they're all kind of common. And so they're going to share a common framework. And so here's how we're going to work together. Then that makes sense. Uh, is your team a team? Is it going to work together on a project? Is the project feasible? That's the real question. So you can have uh, teams that have uh, different disciplines involved. But the project has to make sense, if that if that makes sense. <laughs> um, can team members work at another institution outside of Georgia? So the impact on students has to be USG if you're applying for a transformation grant. You can involve instructors from other institutions if you contract out. These uh, are going to be based on contracts. The contracts are in between the USG and an institution. That institution needs to support bringing in consultants if you do not have somebody at the institution to serve in that role. But in a transformation grant where you're saying, here's how much student savings we're generating, 
if a whole bunch of those are happening at Emory or Mercer, like that's awesome, but it's not something that uh, factors into selection, and it's not it's not data that we would actually report because we are a USG initiative. So you can bring in external folks, but their impact on their students, unless they are also USG faculty, it, it isn't going to uh, apply when it comes to your application. Uh, so same thing with uh, Dr. Zhang. Um, you can include faculty members outside of the USG system. You totally can if they can help out with the project and make it more feasible, make it better, make it cooler. Um, but the impact numbers do not apply to them uh, when they're outside the USG system, if that makes sense. This is a lot of great questions. Nikita, do we have any more? I think we've gotten them covered. Um... Yeah, I think we've gotten them covered. I think for the sake of time, I'll go ahead and pass it back over to you so you can kind of decide where you might be, need to consolidate. And the minimum number of team members. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the so. minimum number of team members is one. That's different from the first couple of rounds where we, we had where you had to have at least two. However, if you've got a transformation grant project and you're just one instructor teaching one course, you're probably not making a huge impact that will stand out among ap uh, applications. So uh, be sure to keep that in mind. Um, the kickoff requirements. So Nikita, please do uh, let us know about that. I can I can cut a lot of my stuff. Uh, I think the questions are much more uh, useful. Makes sense, makes sense. So um, the kickoff requirements, I'm sorry, what, uh, this part, the, is that what you're referring to? Because we did go yes. over that already. That we oh, okay. yeah, that yeah. there's a requirement for the online for the kickoff meeting. Yeah. So here's yeah. here's just a reminder. Keep those kickoff dates in mind when you are applying because you will need to attend um, when you are uh, accepted. So be sure to put that on your schedule. Um, before we move on, okay. So we were gonna run through exactly how to apply for a grant, but these questions were super helpful in a way that is more than a walkthrough. Um, you will be able to see just about all the directions on the application, and you can email us if you ever have a question about it. Uh, so I'm going to go through a lot of this quickly because I do want to respect your time. I do want you to be out of here by 12. Um, so we had a lot of questions already. I'm glad that we did. Uh, let's just go quickly through this. Uh, applying for a grant includes two applications. You want to make sure that you fill out the Word document first. And the reason why is because that will be a file you can keep, that's a file we can keep, and that's a file we can put on a contract later on as your statement of work. Uh, the online one is super important for the selection process, the application process, keeping all of that stuff together, putting our stuff in Excel. Um, you need to do both. Do the offline one, your Word document first. And let's say that you suddenly are out of the country and you cannot, for some reason, get onto the Zoho Projects uh, application at that point. You have that offline document and you can just email it over. Um, be sure to get your letter of support. Uh, that is from your sponsor. So if it is your department, then get it from your department chair. If you're the department chair, it cannot come from you. It has to come from the dean at that point. If you're the dean, uh, get it from the VPAA or provost. Um, just uh, one person above the level administration level of administration for the leadership in the project. Um, and yeah, then you will use the online form to submit all of that stuff at the end. We're not going to do the application walkthrough. I'm going to go through a little bit more of the details. Um, we're going to be using a weighted rubric. We share those rubrics on the apply for a grant page. Uh, they have all of the requirements, including uh, for transformation grants, the student savings impact matters a lot. It's not the only thing, though. Um, how does it impact teaching and learning? Uh, how is the project organized? Is it, um, is it clear? Do we know exactly what it is you're going to do? Same thing with continuous improvement projects. Uh, we obviously are not taking uh, savings impact numbers into account in continuous improvement projects, but organization and planning and feasibility are super important when you're doing a revision project or a creation project. Research grants have a little bit of a different thing too. Uh, the impact of your research topic is going to uh, count in there. Um, oh, 
Um, Dr. Pidani, uh, if you do have a question, please do put it uh, into chat. I just saw your hand raised, but then you lowered it. So maybe you just clicked it uh, on accident. But if you do have a question, please do put it in chat and we'll, we'll address it. Um, other considerations, be sure to check your <laughs> application for errors. Um, check your numbers. And if you have uh, one that's going to be collectively edited, be sure that your comments are gone by the time that you submit it. That seems silly. It almost seems common sense, but it's happens where I'm looking at a thing with track changes enabled and a million comments. And I'm like, oh boy, I can't put this. <laughs> I can't consider this a statement of work yet. We're going to need a final copy. If you have, uh, let's say that English is your second language. That's more common than you think. Get your application checked by a peer reader, uh, somebody who who isn't you, who's who hasn't written that application to see if it is clear what it is you're doing and making sure that everything aligns from the timeline to the budget. Um, for the letter of support, what if the sponsor is not a USG institution, but a technical assistance center with a Georgia team that consists of several USG institutions? The sponsor has to be within the USG. If that is a center that is a USG organization, I think that's fine. Um, but you are going to have to have ownership over this project at your institution or at the institutions. Um, in some ways, because it's several USG institutions, I would almost say get a letter from each one. The reason why we have a letter of support is because let's say that this project comes to fruition. Let's say that we send a contract over. The last thing we want to hear is nobody told me about it and it's happening under my watch. Um, we want to make sure that folks who are making the big decisions are making the decision to say, yes, they can totally do this before it happens. Uh, so be sure to get the USG institutional support that you need. Uh, those letters of support are super important. Uh, Dr. Kalavar says, am I the only person? Oh, if you're the only person teaching a particular course, what would your team be? Um, so if you're the only person teaching a particular course, um, you can look within your department to do a multi-course project with other folks. You could look across other USG institutions to work with people who are teaching the same course at different institutions to do a multi-institution project. Um, be sure that if you're doing a transformation grant, uh, that you're affecting a good amount of students um, with a, a a per student cost, because that's what transformation grants are all about, are making that big savings difference. Uh, continuous improvement grants are more for the, uh, the smaller projects. Uh, no problem. Um, does your budget meet the guidelines? So make sure you have an accurate budget under the maximum per team member. And that does include uh, all of your direct expenses. Um, make sure that the savings impact of the project aligns with the budget. If you have a $30,000 uh, pro uh, pro project that affects 20 students a year and saves them four bucks each, that's not really going to look good on the application. Uh, we're looking for a bit of a social return on investment, uh, not necessarily one that's like, well, our savings are important because we're bringing in revenues. No, that's not what we're looking at. But we are definitely looking to make sure that we are making a big savings impact with the grant funds that we award as good stewards of every single dollar that we spend. Just a, a USG wide um, stewardship of resources requirement. Um, does the team have a plan to share their new materials? D2L is not open. Your students have access to it for no cost. That's great. But nobody else can go in there and get those resources. Nobody else can remix them and revise them and pass that openness along to the next folks. Um, so you will need to have another plan for those materials. If it's Word documents, great. If it's an open course that you make... Uh, with a librarian through their LibGuides platform, that's also great. If you have a campus website, look out, because sometimes those things can get wiped out for no reason, or they can get wiped out because you've left the institution. Have a plan for that, for sure. Um, yeah, and we host those materials. So we'll, we'll do the metadata, we'll do the uploading. You just have to get them to us. Uh, you can do it through Dropbox, Google Drive, all that stuff. Now, there are priority categories in transformation grants. 
Uh, one of those is uh, being uh, collaborating with other types of folks. So it's not just a team of faculty, it's a team of faculty with help from an instructional designer, with help from a librarian, an OER publisher, uh, like the University of North Georgia Press, which publishes open textbooks and does peer review processes. Uh, instructional technologists, web designers, programmers, graphic designers, game designers, all kinds of stuff. If you have a collaborative project like that, it's more likely not just to succeed, but to be like impactful and cool. So yeah, uh, be sure to collaborate if you can. Um, have students involved in the process, not just in filling out a survey at the end, but you know, creating resources, doing the remixing. Like that is student learning just as much as that's student work. And so we have a bit of a priority there. Uh, departmental scaling, is your whole department going to take this on? If you've got an intro psych course and you're just one of 10 uh, instructors, that's great that you're taking that on. But if your entire department commits to it, that's another level. So that is um, a strategic priority. And then if you have an upper level course, often those are smaller. If you're collaborating across different institutions, that's going to be um, another one of the strategic priorities. Now, you don't have to meet any of these in order to qualify, and you don't, have, you don't have to meet any of these in order to stand out as a great project. The application is what matters the most, but these priorities can also help in a really tight selection process. Let's say that we get 100 applications. Well, we can't award all of those. We just don't have the funding for it. Stuff like this will help in that case. So funding is a service level agreement. It is funded 50% at the beginning, 50% at the end. Uh, once the SLA is signed by all parties, you are able to invoice for the first 50%. Once the final report is submitted at the end, you're able to invoice for the last 50%. Invoices come from the institution, not from a foundation in the institution, the institution itself. Um, yeah, and so we um, support these by state funds. Of course, everybody needs to comply with Board of Regents guidelines, with institutional policies. We are not external grants. We are all part of the same organization. Some places still treat it like an external grant. That is their decision to do so. Um, they cannot include indirect expenses. Those are facilities and administration. Those are the we're keeping the lights on for you while an external organization is getting their work done. That's not us, right? We're all the USG. So if you see facilities and administration, we have a standard FNA of 18%. That's stuff that does not apply. Indirect expenses do not apply. Direct expenses uh, apply, including your salary, but also all of the benefits that go with it, your health care, your taxes, et cetera. Um, all of that gets lumped into that maximum. It can't be that you're being paid 5,000 and then here's all the fringes on top of it because that's more than the per team member maximum. And those will differ based on your position. Those will differ based on how much you make. It's, uh, they'll differ based on the institution too. Uh, so be sure to include your fringes in direct expenses, not indirect. So if you see fringes and you say, my grants office said it's this much now, those are indirect. No, 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 that's not. Facilities and administration, your FNA percentage, that is indirect and that does not count. Direct expenses include all of those fringes. So be sure to know that that uh, is, is part of it. All right. I uh, answered a whole bunch of different questions earlier and so did Nikita. So thank you so much for uh, asking all of those. But do we have any more questions before we go? I, I kind of want to send a thank you already. So thank you for being here. If you have any questions, please do email us. Um, we are we can stay here longer and answer these questions, but you are free to go. It is almost 12 o'clock. So thank you so much for your energy and excitement uh, for uh, these grants. Thank you so much for asking all of these cool questions. They are way more helpful than me just explaining a process over and over again. Um, and yeah, uh, Nikita, anything to say also? No, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. But again, we're going to stay behind in case there are other questions you want to ask. Thank you very much. I have an Apple Watch, and it buzzes every single time I get a Teams message. So every thank you is shaking my wrist. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>
And we did okay. have some great questions today. Oh, uh, yeah, go. Claire, go ahead. She dropped them in the chat as well. Oh, no, there. Oh, I see. Okay. Is she unmutes? Uh... Because of the the way that this event is structured, um, there isn't a microphone allowed. But I can. Um, you can allow it though. I can allow it now if you okay. like. Okay, Claire, I'm allowing your mic if you would like to unmute. Oh, great! Thank you. Yeah, I was typing out a novel for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much for this. It was a really uh, great uh, session. So thank you for all the information today. Um, I have a quick question, uh, just if we have a, a, a quick moment, um, about our resources that we made back all the way in round 13 uh, with yeah. you guys. Um, so I know USG is transferring from Google to Microsoft, and that's what we kind of want to do in the upcoming round is work on transferring all of our stuff we made within Google and through Google Forms, all of our homework and uh, ancillary materials to Microsoft or some or other software platform something. Mm -hmm. um, for the stuff that's already in Galileo, do we need to do anything to make sure that is safe? Our university will be phasing out all of our Google files according to IT. And so we might lose that even though it's it's posted through you guys. I am still the owner of those files. Yeah. So maybe we need to email about this later on, but I just wanted to yes. kind of ask quickly. <laughs> yeah, we would love to host the updated and sustainable versions of these. Uh, if they are yeah. going to go away in Google, then we need to not link to those and we need to yeah. just share out, hopefully, uh, just solid files that we can um, just provide that way. Okay, so then that's with this new round, I guess that would be the goal is to find something that is more sustainable that's not in a specific program and then they would just replace the Google files. Yeah. Okay. And if you want to include any accessibility measures in there, if you want mm -hmm. to include any current, uh, you know, currency of information improvements, exactly. that amplifies the impact of that project. Okay. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for that info. And um, just for the current files, they they haven't given us a timeline of when they will go away. Um, they assure us that it will be there at least through a semester. But if I get like a frantic, they're taking away our Google files right now email, I'll let you know since <laughs> what's in Galileo is through uh, through Google. But yeah, um, I'll keep you updated on that for sure. The cool thing about some of the stuff in Google is that you can just kind of uh, grab it and put it somewhere else uh, in a in a format that may not be perfect, but at least would serve a purpose until a real update is done. So. If we find if we get that warning from you, we'll uh, try our best to preserve things. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for the info. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Bye. -bye. All right, I am about to end them. Oh yes, Dr. Padani, um, I'll enable your mic as well. There we go. Now you can uh, you can unmute if you would like. Thank you. Um, sorry, the last time my hand went up was a mistake. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> um, I was just trying to figure out how to get back to the uh, PowerPoint. Um, one question I have, I'm transforming a course from in-person to asynchronous. Mm -hmm. And so that involves, aside from getting the sources and stuff, involves recording lectures and stuff. Would recording lectures, uh, putting together PowerPoints, uh, you know, curating all that stuff, uh, would that be part, could that be part of a project? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to be creating these, making them accessible, and then having them under an open license, um, that would be a great continuous improvement grant. So you're, you're going through this revision process, but also you're making all of them open and you're making all of them as accessible as possible. That's really cool stuff uh, that, that opens up the world of OER to more subjects just by doing that. The, would I apply for another one? Because the other thing I'm, um, I don't know if I'll have time to do it, but uh, I have a textbook for the first, it's a modern East, it's a East Asia. So pre-modern, modern. There's a pre-modern textbook that's free uh, that a colleague wrote years ago that's good. A modern one, there isn't. Mm -hmm. Would that yeah. fall under, okay. I mean, that that sounds great. Um, be sure to uh, be very clear about your project and keep it feasible. And, you know, if you need to space it out because of that, 
than do. Um, but yeah, it's uh, sounds like a great idea. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Jennifer. I I do not see your oh, Doctor Snelling. I see you here. I will allow your mic. There we go. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, I have some questions. Well, first of all, um, is this slideshow going to be available after this presentation? Yeah. So we're going to share that alongside the video. Um, once the video is processed. So we have to wait for Microsoft to say it's available. Then I've got to process it through YouTube, get the transcription in there. And once that's all done, I'm going to email all of the attendees and say, hey, we've got this available here. Um, it's also going to be on the apply for a grant page. Okay. And also, like, this is my first time actually doing this. Mm -hmm. So how do I locate the teams? that are doing the same exact thing in, within the institution. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So you want to find out. Somebody to show me to, you know, how things are done, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you want to find out um, where grants have already happened at your institution, what you can do is go into our grants archive and you can filter out by the institution. So I'm going to give you a link to it. It's also on our site under our our, uh, our grants nav bar. Okay. And yes, uh, so this is Power BI. And if you just click on the institution part and uh, you find yours, click the checkbox there, you'll see all the projects that have happened. And so there's you know a limited amount of information because we can't have the table go on forever. Oh, but yeah. the reports have all of that information available. Oh, wow. I mean, so does it have to be a team or can you like do it by yourself or what? Yeah, so it's going to depend on the projects, whether or not it works as a solo project or not. So let's say that you are you want to do a transformation grant, which is the larger amount of funding per person, but also it's dependent on how much you're impacting student savings. If you teach super sections of 300 students uh, and it's you know each fall and spring, then as a solo project, that could work. Also, you're probably doing a lot of work on the side of that too. Um, but if you're not teaching that many students and you're trying to do a transformation grant project where everything is dependent on uh, impacting student savings, then a solo project probably doesn't work. Um, you would want to team up with other faculty who can also make a difference in that case. Uh, with continuous improvement grants, if you can do it alone, then that works. It has to be a feasible project, but yes, it would qualify. Uh, research projects, same thing. Uh, you know, you can do a solo project there so long as it's feasible for you to do so. Hmm. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right. OK, I'm going to uh, end the meeting now. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, and again, if you have any questions about this, if you're watching this video, I'm at jeff.galana at usg.edu, and Nikita is at nikita.afaha at usg.edu. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.